Paul Ruse here from Performance by Design and welcome to the Culture Couch. And it's pretty exciting, my uh, co-host Jared Murphy. It is the first time, for those who've been following it, the first time we are actually on the couch. We've got a real couch, Ruzi, and it's fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so Jared Murphy, my partner, but also our first guest on the couch today is Tammy Ruse, who's in charge of our wellness section for Performance by Design. But Tammy, just give us a bit about your background and an intro to the people watching at home. Thank you. Yes, so um, I was born and raised in America. Um, I came to Australia with, uh, I guess all my background really was in that business world. It was, I had an MBA in international management and had done my studies in the States, um, got to Australia and moved between Melbourne and um, Sydney. And when I arrived in Sydney, I think what happened was uh, Paul was playing for the Swans at the time and a girlfriend of mine said, why don't you go off and try this weekend workshop in meditation? And I really had no idea what meditation was. I had no expectation around meditation. It was something that, to be honest, we just thought, well, we'll, we'll give it a go. So Paul and I, we both went off. We did this weekend workshop and it was the result of what transpired that weekend, I guess, which has led us to probably while I'm sitting, why I'm sitting here now. Um, and that was just the, the benefits that I personally started experiencing um, from a meditation practice led me to further my study. So I went and did my PhD in parapsychic science. I wrote my dissertation on meditation. And that was really fundamentally around all the core things um, in terms of what a cumulative meditation practice does to the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual bodies of a person. So those benefits um, leading to more contentment, peace of mind, and clarity of thinking. So that really was his premise. And from there, I started teaching. I started going into the corporate space, um, did a lot of public speaking, been running some retreats, and have an online program now. And that's a summation of who I am. So let's start with the, the basics of what is meditation? If, if someone says to you, because, it, and obviously you talk a lot about it, but there's a little bit of a, not a stigma, but it's a funny sort of term meditation. Mm. So simplify that and, and in simple terms, what is meditation? Yep. Um, and then we can go into the, to the benefits. But what, how would you describe it? Yep. So meditation simply is um, learning to relax the body and quiet the mind. I look at it as it's a form of relaxation. And if you really, if you, if you think of it in that way that you know that you're, what you're doing is just a form of relaxation, uh, the number one benefit being the reduction of stress and anxiety, you can see how there's a correlation. Obviously, all of us automatically think, well, when we're, we're relaxed, we're less stressed. Um, but that's fundamentally what meditation is. It's learning to relax the body, quiet the mind. You go into that deeper state of rest, which is why it's so powerful. And then we have all the benefits. And I think the good thing about having Murphy today, we've probably got the, the two types of personalities that one is is the personality that's going to trust a bit and say, you know, being a, a, an ex-footballer, you sort of, well, yeah, I'll do yoga, I'll do Pilates, I'll, yeah, meditation sounds. Mm. But then you've got sort of more the academic type mm. like Murph, who's sort of been in the leadership space for a long period of time, deals with a lot of CEOs, Murph, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember reading your PhD and for those real analytical types, mm. Tell us, take us inside the mind for want of a better term and what actually happens to the mind when you do meditate because there's been so many studies around the benefits of it. Yep. So I guess really just to educate anyone who's listening who doesn't know, I, I think it's good to probably lay a bit of a, a, a a foundation here for the benefits. So I've already mentioned number one benefit is reduction of stress and anxiety. Um, we know that when we meditate too, what happens is the brain, so the left and right hemisphere of our brain becomes coordinated. So you get this, um, the left side of our brain being the analytical thinking side and the right side of our brain, the creative side. When we create a bridge between the two, what happens is we become much more um, orderly. So that means we procrastinate less, we get more efficient, with our time, we know what we need to do to get things done. So that's a, a definite byproduct. What also happens is with this reduction of stress and anxiety within the body, then we know that our communication skills are enhanced as well. And again, everything I'm talking about has been scientifically validated. So we know the number one precursor to poor communication is stress and anxiety. So you can see how if you're engaged in a practice that's gonna help you communicate more effectively, 
the, the positive byproduct that's going to have for you in all areas of your life. That's with family, that's with um, in the office space, with colleagues, friends, you name it. You're going to have a, a benefit from that. You also have greater insights into um, into really just knowing what needs to be required. And some of the latest um, scientific evidence is showing that a consistent meditation practice being six weeks leads to an increase in our immune system of 31%. So that's pretty huge. So most people, we're geared or we're, we've been programmed, um, I'm sure both of you have heard of fight or flight. So we know what happens. So when we're in that sympathetic nervous system, it's the getting the body ready. We're going to go. We're going to fight. So that increases our stress levels, right? So when we meditate, what happens is we then actually go into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is that... So it's affecting our, you know, the autonomic nervous system. So it relaxes everything down. So it takes us out of that state. And we know that that's more the healing state. That's why the immune system can be benefited greatly when you take yourself out of fight or flight. So those are just really some of the simplistic, I guess, um, you know, that's benefits, but also some of the things that happen. The other things that happen is we know from all the studies and you know we have e, um, we have the EEGs now, so we get you know you can get set up and you can have the electrodes on the brain, et cetera. We know that with um, long term meditators, what happens when we go um, into a meditative state is our brain waves are affected. So right now you and I are engaged in this beta, yeah. So it's the doing, um, you know, the action state when you meditate. And again, I should clarify, sorry, this isn't just long-term meditators um, because when you do meditate, it has this impact. But you start going into the, um, the alpha and the theta brain waves. And when you're in, those, um, in that theta state, they say that's when you're your most creative. That's when you really get those aha moments. So again, for someone who is probably like running a business or you're, you're trying to do something, come up with, with solutions to, to things that are going on, you can imagine how powerful that state is because you have access, and this is one thing that most people don't understand, you have more access to your brain and your brain's power, okay, so to speak, I'm gonna name it the brain capacity in that state than at any other time. But we don't access it like this, you access it when you're in that theta state. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so how often do you have to practice meditation to get to, to, get to a level where it's going to have a, an impact throughout your life? like a a regular impact on a day-to-day -day basis? Look, most most evidence is showing a six-week consistent practice, which is daily. So again, unfortunately, there's no quick fix. There's no magic pill. Like anything in life, it requires work, it requires practice. Um, and I think that's one of the things that holds people back because they think, oh, it's just one more thing to do. But in reality, you know, I would challenge everyone on this. Um, if you don't, you know, if you if you look at our mobile phones and how attached we are to those, yeah. Jared, like you think about that, we get stressed leaving our house if if we don't have it charged. We think, yeah. how are we going to get through the day? How are we going to answer our emails? Are we going to get that phone call or or whatever it may be? And and we even go to the point of going, okay, do I have a charger in the car? The next meeting I go to, how am I going to charge my phone up? Because I actually want that to be running at optimal, um, you know, like full charge. But we don't even consider what our mind's doing for us. And we're quite prepared to leave the house every single day, never having done anything to recharge our mind. And I really want to stress there's a difference here because what they've shown is rest, sorry, sleeping is a different state to a meditative sleep state, totally different. So you can't compare the two. When you are meditating, the body is still and you go into that state of mind that I was speaking of, the brain waves being affected and you've gone out of fight or flight. So again, remember you've gone out of sympathetic into the parasympathetic nervous system. What happens is you're in a deep, deep state of rest, but with heightened awareness or alertness. So that's actually why there is this, there's this, um, really this heightened state of recovery state. So it's a very different state that you're in. So if you do that though, what that means is you're plugging in. So with the analogy of the phone, you've just re-plugged your mind, you've charged yourself up so that you can head out the door going, you know what, instead of like, to be honest, the majority of people on this planet running at less than an optimal level. I mean, I call this, this is for high performance. This is literally for optimal functioning that you want to recharge your mind. 
but we've we you know we don't do it we've taken it for granted we yeah. we actually we literally take our minds for granted and we expect that it should be doing everything 24 7 seven days a week with no rest so when you say a six-week program does that mean half an hour in the morning and half an hour at night or does it 10 minutes or is it an hour what, yeah, what, what no, does that look like no it's a great question so look <clears throat> for me personally number one um you can start to have an impact in your life and start experiencing benefits in as little as five to 10 minutes a day. So choose a time of day that works with your schedule, number one, because if you make it harder for yourself, most people know you're not gonna do it. I choose to meditate first thing in the morning because like the analogy with the phone, I'd rather start my day feeling charged and ready to go. However, if it's not working, um, or if that didn't work for you and something's happened in your mind, you know, your day didn't start off and you're already chasing, you know, getting out the door, then do it when you can. If it's midday, look at it as a reset. If it's before you go to bed at night, 10 minutes. Okay, so allow your mind to rest before you go to sleep at night. Allow yourself to let go of, of the busyness, the craziness, the monkey brain that I call it, so that you then can have a um, really deep state of rest and sleep. Yeah. On that, just some practical tips. So why don't people do it? What are, the, what are the main impediments that you see? And to overcome those impediments, because I think your point is right, there's this notion that in meditation <clears throat> you have to spend a lot of time. If, you know, yeah. you start at 20 minutes and you said, oh, 20 minutes in an hour. And I think that's a general philosophy, isn't it? People mm. don't do it because they, they tend to think, oh, I haven't got an hour to, to, to do. So it, it shouldn't be that much. I mean, we talk about if you if you've never run before, you're not going to run a marathon. No, exactly. You're going to start by going yeah. for a walk yeah. and then you're going to do a 1K or then a 2K and a 3K. Mm. So just a little bit of summary for people listening. What are, what are some of the things in their mind they're thinking, oh, I can't do it because of this? And what are the solutions to that that allows them to then get into that regular practice? Yep, Okay. Very good question because I think that it's 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 um it's human nature just you know when you're starting to learn something that you kind of can make some excuses for yourself. So number one, the number one thing I hear is I don't have enough time. Okay, so first thing I would say to that is if you're really looking to start your day off, um, you know, in that and recharge, set your alarm and actually make a conscious choice that at least for the next X number of days, I'm going to give myself the benefit of doubt and I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to literally set the alarm, make it five to 10 minutes, right? Earlier than you normally would have. And again, I think what we have to start to understand is that our personal, our, our mental health, it's our responsibility. So our health's our responsibility. So you have to set some time aside to actually look at that, to actually do that. If you don't, then to be honest, nothing's gonna change. So set the alarm. If you're asleep anyway, you're not realizing what you're missing out. Like, so, you know, if you don't look at your phone first thing too, I would say that's another big key thing before you meditate because then that already gets you started into the mind move, moving. Do not reach for that mobile phone first thing, okay? So if you set the alarm, that's a great way. If, if that's not gonna work, <clears throat> excuse me, and you think you're really, um, you know, you're not a morning person, um, or you think, you know what, my mind's already racing. I actually encourage people to write out a, a list like, okay, get those to-do things down on the piece of paper so it's not a distraction. And that would go into the second basic, biggest excuse I hear, which is my mind is too busy, okay? Mm -hmm. I can't sit still, my mind's too busy. Well, okay, write, write it down, now it's there. You're not going to forget what you're, you know, what you have. Your thoughts will, or you will come back to your thoughts. The third thing is, I think that people get caught up with is they think that, um, in terms of that, they have to be in this state of bliss. That you, you have to go to this place of no thought. That's not what meditation is. It's simply learning to slow down the number of thoughts. So we know the average human being has seventy thousand thoughts a day. And if you counted those, one, two, three, four, that, like that's a lot of thoughts, right? So you're just looking at a way to go all right, I'm just going to become the observer. I'm going to watch them come in and go out my mind. But it's not about having to be in this state of bliss. You're le literally learning to just go, all right, I'm going to come back to my breath. And if I go back to my breath and I just slow down 
again, five to 10 minutes a day. It's just about finding, finding those times. And I think those would be three of the biggest tips that I would have about not thinking that you have to be in silence. You, you do have to make a conscious choice, your, your mental health, just like our physical health. We know physical health and we accept. We'll, we'll go and buy a membership at the gym or we'll go for a run or we'll go for a walk. We've accepted it. I think the big hindrance is we don't know what we don't know. So we haven't really, in westernized cultures, we haven't really emphasized the benefit of looking after the mind. It's not something we've been taught as children, right? So that's a big thing. I think that that's something that we really need to start educating ourselves on. Every one of us on the planet has mental health. It is not a negative. We all have it, we all need it. Yeah. Um, you know, like you've got a brain, which we all do, or we'd be dead, right? So, so that in reality, we have to look after that mental mental side as well. We we get taught to eat the right food groups, to drink enough water, to exercise and sleep. This is just the additional bit, which is, you know, look after the mind, learn to love the mind, give it that rest and recharge. So, so that's a well and good. So, I've I've been practicing for six weeks, doing the ten minutes morning and night, and then. I walk into the office and here's Rusey being a dick, giving me a hard time. <laughs> and so how does meditation help me there? Because the truth is, it's all very well and good to practice morning and night. But on a day-to-day -day basis, how does it play out when I walk into the office and there's stuff going on everywhere and it's really stressful? Okay, that is such a great question. The longer you meditate, and again, this goes back to one of Paul's earlier references, it's about this trust component, you will begin to notice that things that in the past would have bothered you, so science has shown you're much less emotionally reactive the more you meditate, which means you go into a state of responding rather than yeah. reacting. So if you're a leader or you've been a coach or you're running a team or whatever it might be and you realize I have this moment right now. It's like you 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 get this little pause, and it could be a fraction of a of a second. That's all you need to take that breath and go. It's just that hint. I I just need to pause before I respond, before I say anything. And if I you know, and that's how it will start to benefit you. So it literally, Paul, you come in the office. Paul's ranting and raving. So you you've got two Again. choices: either you engage at that same level, and it goes, and it's just a train wreck. Or you actually go, you know what, I'm gonna take a deep breath and pause and go, how do I best respond here? Okay, and then you can choose how you're going to address the situation. Is it, Paul, why don't you come into the office, let's have a chat, what's going on? Maybe you have more awareness that maybe something, Paul's not normally like this, something had to have happened to trigger him. This isn't normal behavior. If it is normal behavior, then maybe you have to say, you know what, I've got this great new tool I'd really like you to start engaging in. <laughs> you need and meditation, it's called Rizzi. meditation. <laughs> I think the, the, the trust is a big part of it, isn't it? Because yeah. as a as a long-term meditator myself, yeah, and, and as an athlete, you can always time yourself doing a 1K or a 2K or even lift and weights move. Is you can sort of say, well, I've just gone from 100 kilos to 102. Yeah. So it's more measurable. Yeah. And I, you talk about it a lot. The meditation other people will see it in you potentially before you see it in yourself. 100%, yeah. And um, and that's what's so important, I think, there. Again, it's because, and this is exactly what happened, so it was a, a great segue. When Paul and I learned to meditate, and this was in 1999, and again, remember, I had no expectations. We didn't know what it was. Our facilitator literally said to us, you may not understand or feel like anything's really happening, but it's gonna be those around you that start making observations, and that's gonna be this like real aha moment, and that's exactly what happened for me. I can remember where I was, I was about three months into the practice, and a neighbor came, ac came across the road and said, what are you doing, you look so different. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, you're just different. She said, you're just, you're calmer. <laughs> and I said, and I went, nothing. And I really, I wasn't connecting the dots, to be honest, Jared, like I was thinking, Okay, I'm still doing the same thing. Two kids were rushing around. Um, Paul's coaching or, you know, your assistant coach then. I was like going, no, same thing, still doing my workouts. And then all of a sudden she goes, no, 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 you've got like kind of like this glow. <laughs> and I went, oh my gosh, it's the meditation. And it went right back. And this was again, and then that's, and literally, and to be perfectly honest, that's how I started teaching as well. More and more people said, whatever it is you're doing, Tammy, I wanna learn what it is. What is it that you're doing? What are you, I wanna learn this skill set because you're so calm now. 
So number one that highlighted to me, I obviously wasn't being perceived as this calm individual prior to, and now, so they were noticing, like I literally was changing. I knew I felt better in myself, as in I knew what I wanted for myself when I started the practice, which was I wanted to have more patience, I wanted to be calmer, I wanted to be more available for the kids, for Paul, and for my friends and people around me, but I had been feeling really tired and burnt out. And it's like, so that was one of my big objectives was I'm tired of feeling so tired and burnt out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So that was what I started to notice. And the more I did it, the better I started feeling. And then people noticed. And I think you talked about reacting, responding rather than yeah. reacting. Yeah. What about if we break it down to follow on Murph's analogy? Are there simple breathing techniques or simple techniques that you can extricate yourself from that situation, potentially yep. go into your office, or even when you're getting home, we talk about work-life balance, which I reckon is garbage because it's just life balance. It's not work-life mm. balance. But is there simple breathing techniques or techniques that people coming out of that really stressful meeting or coming home after a really stressful day and about to enter the the work, the, the home front, what, what are some of the little techniques you could recommend to people in those moments? Yeah, absolutely. The, the simplest technique by far is just, as Paul's mentioning, go to the breath. So if you can find a, um, if, so if you're coming home and you've had a really not a great day and you think I've got to go in now, Okay, sit in the car, close your eyes, and literally, if you listen to the sound of your inhalation and exhalation, this isn't only in those moments, I'm giving you a tip for all the meditators as well. If you listen to the sound of the inhalation with your ears and the exhalation, science has shown you cannot have a thought. So if you focus on that sound, in breath, in breathing, and then exhaling, you can't have a thought. What that does automatically, and you will feel the responses, you feel everything go, it, 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 it comes in, it's like your awareness take, is brought into your body, you feel your muscles relax, you literally start getting that physiological response. You can shift something in a space of, and I always say take 10 cycles of breath, in breathing and then exhaling, really nice, deep, Inhalations and exhalations keep it the same rhythm and you will feel yourself relax. And that would be, that is, again, you can even do that before you have a phone call to make too. So say you have a, you're feeling on edge, you've got to make this sale, or this is really important, you want to nail it, you're feeling a bit, you know, like, because you, you want this, and you're feeling a bit stressed, go and do 10, 10 cycles of breath, come back to your center, because the reality is you, you already do know it. I used to use this with students and even with, when I was working with the players at, at Sydney, at the Swans and at the Melbourne Demons, they know what to do. So, you know, like, so it's like, that's already there, but go back to that state where you can be relaxed with that heightened state of awareness and then it flows. And as you mentioned there, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sport has been using meditation and mindfulness for a long time. Um, do many corporates do it and do they incorporate into their day? And is it something that, they can do if they if you had CEOs or leaders that wanted to bring that into the workplace. Okay, I think that was three questions to try to answer all of them. One, yes, they absolutely can do it. Um, two, are they doing it? I think there's a mixed bag. I, what's happening though, and what I'm seeing is the companies that are showing success are the ones that are showing that it's starting from the top down because everyone values it and understands the benefit to the workspace if they engage in it. So lead and by example, reason. Really. Lead by exactly. example. Yeah. And I think some of the and things you, that- You've got some good examples of that where, without mentioning the companies, but- Absolutely. With when the leader does it as opposed to when the leader doesn't. Yeah. When the leader does it, you get this engagement and people feel they have permission then to do this. And what happens is it's like, wow, there's some genuine care that, and there's there, you're building this win-win situation where they go, you know what, um, we're valued. We have this situation now where it's not us versus them. And that's a huge thing right now. Understand like that whole idea of divisions, even departments in companies, as we know, some people think, oh, the executive team gets more benefits or it's marketing or it's, do you know what I mean? So it's like, when you get everyone doing something together, you create a really cohesive team atmosphere. It's yeah. the win-win, everyone's doing it. On the flip side, companies I've worked with where the executive says, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And then all of a sudden, and again, I say this respectfully, but the idea of self-importance comes in. This phone call is more important than me doing this with my team. This meeting, this email, whatever it is, then what starts happening is, well, they're not doing it. They must not value it. 
And if I do it, maybe I'm going to get in trouble and he's going to think or she's going to think I'm not working. So then they stop doing it. And then the, the, in addition to that, then it might even be others in the office that start talking behind the people's backs that are actually choosing to try to do something that's so beneficial to them, looking after, again, plugging themselves in and looking after their mental health. Yeah. So in terms of if you were running a company, how would you set it up personally? Because I know there's a couple of companies that we deal with, mm. but also great story when you went to India, and I think it was, was the bell went off every hour. Yeah, um, yeah. So maybe tell that story as well, but how would you implement it as a, as a yeah. CEO? My perfect case scenario would be one, you'd actually get, you know, you'd be, you'd, you'd actually have someone come in, talk about meditation, teach you how to meditate as a group and just, and, you know, go through the benefits, really go through what to experience the changes you can expect, how it will impact your company in terms of productivity and efficiency, performance, all those things. Again, optimal functioning or optimal performance, being your best version of yourself and then that impact. And just without interrupting, just on that, I think it's a really important point. There's a couple of studies in America where productivity, absenteeism has gone down. So the actual, the bottom line of the company is improved because of the meditation practice. 100%. And again, that's, that's the funny thing is that people still aren't seeing this connection. They are not seeing the correlation. If you do the right thing by yourself mentally, every single area of your life improves. Like, and again, when, when I did my PhD, there was 800 research and review papers in 33 countries around the world. That was in 2007. We're now 2020. Um, I, you know, it, it's well over 2,000 papers. I know last year in the United States, three papers were being published a week on meditation and mindfulness, a week. The, the evidence, the data is there. It absolutely works. And it is incredible how... Um, you know, in terms of performance, what happens. Forbes did an article of the most successful business people or people that, you know, you kind of view the Oprah Winfrey's and Richard Branson's and people with this, you know, really kind of like some mega big companies and a lot on their plate in terms of management. And they all wrote down their 10 top things they do every day. And every one of them had meditation in there. And they all said they could not do what they did or do without a meditation practice. And I think that's really, so you look at that and, and I, sometimes I laugh when they say, oh, even if you're talking about the athletes, okay, so if it's a Michael Jordan or it was LeBron James or if it was, um, you know, if it was the Sydney Swans or if it was, you know, like Mick Fanning, look at some of the players and, and athletes around the world that have meditated. And you go, well, so, you know, it's and it's not about, I, th I think it's a funny thing, but if you look at, okay, Forbes, the most successful business people, and you look at these athletes, they're all striving to be the best version of themselves, but they've all understood they have to look after themselves mentally. You cannot, to get that extra 1% or 2% can mean the shift, you know, that's the shift. Um, in reference to your point about India though, and this is what's really interesting was, um, I was in India last year and they had this concept which was phenomenal that on the hour every so like on the top of the hour a, there would be a a bell and then this music played for one minute every hour on the hour starting at about 7 a.m and it went until 9 p.m at night and when that bell started you had to stop talking stop moving stop doing anything and just like literally stand and be and at first i was like oh this is interesting and then it was like oh wow this really works it actually brought me back mm. to a space of being really aware. Mm. So it was this awareness space. And I went, this is so powerful. So when you say, what's this ideal? Because I want to make sure we answer the question. Yeah, yeah. The ideal way that a company can set this up in terms of getting all these benefits and why people are doing it that are so successful. I, my ideal scenario would be, again, everyone gets you know taught about meditation, what it is. But then can you as a company, again, just say, you know what? We are going to commit to this. So say it's 8.30, Monday, we're gonna do this for 10 minutes as a group. We're all in the office anyway, or if it's via Skype, Zoom, whatever it might be, 10 minutes, guys, we're all on and everyone's logged in. So you can see we're engaged. This is important. We're trying to create something. This is how we're starting off our week. Because you can, you know, intention setting, which is a whole other topic. There's a lot of things you can do with meditation. Set your week up. I would do a Wednesday morning as well. Okay, it's our midweek reset and Friday, I'd be like, you know what, this is like we're winding down, getting ready for a weekend, but you cannot underestimate the difference when people feel valued, 
people feel like there's some genuine care there, that you're building relationships. Um, I just, you know, it's just th that whole idea of compassion and empathy, all of it, the, the EQ, everything starts going through the roof with the meditation practice. It goes back to <clears throat> almost everything we talk about, really. The leader must role model it. The, you've mm -hmm. got to build good habits, so you have to build it into the systems. You've got to care, develop it. It, it all goes to the same thing. Yeah, it does. And it's about. interesting now because a lot of the workplaces you go into have got these spaces that they seem to be building. You yeah. Know, it's a gym, a meditation area, and so forth. And I talked about it the other day. It's like if the workers sort of see the CEO go in there or the, the leader going in, in the morning, it's a lot, case of, oh, okay, he's. And it's giving them permission to do that. Mm. We talk so much about role modelling. Um, and that really is one of the fundamental keys, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it is. It's just you you really are, you have to walk the, walk the walk, talk the talk, so to speak. You have to be that living example. I mean, I, I guess that's one of the things that I can honestly say. Meditation is my non-negotiable. So I get up every day. And I meditate. For me, it's no different than brushing my teeth. I would not leave my house without brushing my teeth in the morning. I don't leave the house without meditating. Again, but this has been based on a habit. Again, med meditating now almost 22 years, but I know the difference. And it's so significant that that's my choice, that this is how I want to operate. So it is, again, just lead by example. And I think in this, this time, which is obviously dramatically different, but what it's allowed a lot of people to do is think about their own personal development. And for mm. you, I guess there's hopefully there's <clears throat> companies out there, Murph, that we know we deal with and, and pushing that wellness space. But there's also now the ability to, to do it online. So if you, if you can't actually, you know, if you haven't got a boss that's doing it, it's not a case of, of helplessness and what do I do? So it's about your personal choices. So you, you, the last sort of six weeks I've seen you put a lot of stuff online. So mm. now the ability to, to look after yourself, how important is that for people to say, well, okay, well, my workplace is not providing it or, you know, but I have to do it myself and these are the tools that I can do to, to make myself better. Yep. Um, and, and that's a great question because, again, it comes back to our own personal responsibility. And I think this is what most people don't understand. And I find that really interesting is that it's, it's not my government's responsibility and it's not my husband's or my kids or anyone else's responsibility to look after Tammy's health. I can do it. I'm the only one. Like, I know if I'm feeling tired. I know if I'm frustrated. I know if, if I feel like, oh, I've got a scratchy throat or whatever it might be. That's on me. No one else can do that for me because no one knows what's going on inside of me better than me. So this, and again, the whole thing though is, is you don't learn to meditate because anything's broken. Okay, so that's a fundamental thing that I, you know, has to get across as well. If you go online, you're saying, I'm going online because I actually value, I'm placing a value on myself. I do want to be happier. I do want to have more contentment. I do want to feel in better health. I do want to increase my immune system. I do want to sleep better. Or I do want better relationships. I mean, I can go through all the benefits over and over again, but that's on me. So if, if I know that that's what is going to happen, the longer I do this, the greater the benefits in all areas. It's a cumulative practice. So you can't meditate on a Monday and feel good on Friday. The more you engage in this space, the, the better the benefits. So and, and the other thing that I haven't even commented on, which I think is fascinating and a lot of people are talking about it now, but, and it's not from the idea about the, the it, this is about, again about health and well-being. Science has shown, there's a marker, our anti-aging marker called the DHEAS level, right? Long-term meditators, when they are tested, that marker shows that they test 12 years younger wow. than their biological age. Better try it, Rizzy. <laughs> I'm, so, <clears throat> I'm 106. <laughs> you, you did start playing in 19, uh, sorry, 18, 1953. <laughs> no, but do you, do you understand? So, yeah. so what that's showing you, again, think about that. I'm testing 12 years younger than my biological age as a long-term meditator. And actually, and I, I will preface that because I did get tested when we were in Sydney So because I thought I... <laughs> Because I actually, and if anyone is is wondering, okay, what you know, do the research yourself. I encourage people learn to think for yourself, research for yourself. Don't take what I'm saying for granted. Like, go ahead, do the research yourself. And we had this great example of um, 
one of the Swans players who's the biggest skeptic of all time, and I won't mention his name, and I loved having him with the group because he challenged me on everything. And then finally one day he goes, you know what? I got home, I researched everything. He said, everything you said, it's actually true. I said, do you think I'm sitting here telling you this because it's not true? So that was funny, but it, it's when I went and got tested, this woman had said to me, I know you've been meditating for a while. I'd love to do the test. I said, I would love this because... Again, I'm really passionate about it. I really, we have got a mental health crisis around the world. The data is there. World Health Organization announced, this was three years ago, by 2020, it was going to be the single greatest cost to governments worldwide would be mental health. We're already seeing it. It's here now. We know with what's happened with the COVID-19 and the pandemic, they are already highlighting this is going to be the biggest biggest cost worldwide. We have to do some things though and and educate and come from a space of care to help others out so they understand there's something you can do to make you feel better um, and just engage in life with more flow. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna have challenges. I'm not absolutely not saying you don't feel loss or grief or frustration or anger. The difference is you're able to flow through it with much more ease and grace. So you know that it's going to pass. Yeah, I think just to finish up, a great message about we probably, as a, as a uh, country and even worldwide, we stop thinking for ourselves. So mm-hmm. it's a great message. Look it up. Have a look at all the research. Yeah. It, it's just so much research out there. And then take it on yourself. It's, it is a personal responsibility. As much as Murph, you and I deal with companies, and we really want to try and integrate that notion of wellness, but you've still got the option yourself. So, Tammy, fantastic tips, um, hopefully practical tips mm. for people that are just going to trust and they're going to go and do it. But there's a lot of people out there that, that want to know the benefits and want to yeah. know the facts. So a gr- great conversation. Mm. I know having done it you know, for 20-odd years and introducing the swans and, and you know, there's so much data. At Melbourne Footy Club, we did it, made it compulsory, did it before main training sessions. We did the visualisation on game day, which yeah. certainly helped um, transition a really tough period for the Melbourne players to to get through the, you know, being bogged down by the past. And I know we had a, a philosophy of, of talking about reset and players used to come off yeah. the ground and they'd purposely yeah. reset on the on the interchange bench and they'd go back on and it was incredibly valuable. So I think, you know, I think just one thing too, Rizzy, I think uh, your passion for meditation is apparent, Tammy, and I think you're living proof that if you can be 12 years younger than your biological age and still be married to Paul Roos. There is something in meditation. <laughs> yeah, great finish, Murph. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. But no, it, a fantastic. And again, think to yourself, take it, Take personal responsibility. There's mm-hmm. never been a more important time to get healthier. You know, you can improve so many aspects of your, Absolutely. your life, yeah. your personal well-being. So Tammy Roos um, on the Culture Couch today. Uh, Stay tuned for our next episode. Thanks, Murph. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you. Thank you.